Hello, friends. I am Bishop Jerry Hayes, Abbot General of the Apostolic Disciples of the Way. And uh, some of our affiliates have asked me to make a short video on church planting. Church planting is something that uh, I have been intimately involved in uh, over the years and still am in a secondary way by encouraging ministers to uh, launch out into the deep and to let down their nets for a drought. But uh, I have served as a home missionary in uh, such places as northern uh, Illinois, eastern Kentucky, in the Appalachian area, and in Baltimore, and in Maine, and uh, in uh, North Alabama, and in New York City, and also in upstate New York, and now here in southeastern Texas. So church planting is something that is very dear to me, and uh, something that I felt like I was called into from, from very young adulthood. Uh, and I'm going to be sharing with you some of those experiences, hopefully today, if, if that's the way that it works out. But before we get into this, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you who sit upon the circle of the earth, we ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness. Touch my mind, Lord, and my words, that I might communicate the burden of my heart to the benefit of some home missionary somewhere in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus told his disciples on the day that he ascended up into heaven that they would be witnesses of him in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. And we find that that exactly did happen just in that way with uh, Peter and the apostles in Jerusalem and Judea, with Philip in Samaria, and also to the Ethiopian eunuch uh, on his journey uh, from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia, there in the wilderness. And uh, then to, again, Peter and Cornelius. And also, Peter, not forget, in Samaria. So that's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about sort of a Samaritan kind of ministry. Now, everyone is appreciative of their home church, and we give often in a monthly offering, usually for foreign missions, uh, but uh, too much of the time we forget about Samaria, that city that is a hundred miles up the interstate, or uh, that uh, city without a witness that is in the next state over from us. And of course, I think in terms of an American and of here in the United States of America, where really we, we have a uh, federation of 50 countries, if you, if you just want to think about it that way. Each state has its own constitution and uh, its own elected officials, so forth and so on, and then they function in a federation of, of states in, uh, in the big state then of the United States of America. Uh, but if you are in Europe uh, listening to this, watching this video, or if you're in Africa, and, and we have people who are faithful watchers in, in, in Europe, uh, in uh, Russia, in the Ukraine, in the Philippines, in India, uh, in Australia, in Mexico, and in Brazil in particular, and just numerous places that uh, I you know, would forget if I tried to name them all. Uh, so if you're there, still yet, uh, the idea of Samaria, the idea of home missions is uh, germane to you as well when talking about that uh, city or that community or that county that is without a witness. Now, I want to make this clear before I even begin. I am a oneness Pentecostal bishop. Now, as such, I have a true church doctrine. 
What I mean by that is that I believe that Christ died but for one church. And that there are a lot of organizations in the world today calling themselves churches that are not. They are uh, churches of iniquity, meaning they operate and do many great deeds outside the legality of the true apostolic faith. So when I talk about establishing churches, I'm talking about establishing the true church, not the church of iniquity. You can just about imagine anything you want to imagine as far as false doctrine today. And there is a church out there that calls itself Christian that would teach that. But I'm talking about uh, an Acts, Book of Acts church that baptizes in the name of the Lord Jesus, that believes in one only sentient being as God, and that God, having unfolded himself as the Father in creation, the Son in redemption, and the Holy Spirit in emanation. I'm talking about churches that, and, and this is something that the... Uh, that, that we really need to open our eyes to churches that see the importance of the sacraments of water baptism and the Lord's Supper. So uh, when I talk about establishing churches, uh, I want to be fair and in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm talking about establishing churches that are true churches that are on the true foundation of the apostles, prophets, and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, and uh, that preaches the true one saving gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if I say something in this video that would offend you, please take what I have just said into account. Now, I believe that God is concerned about everything that calls itself Christian. I really do believe that. But I believe that there is only one church. There can be a lot of different kinds of Christian fellowships. But there's only one church. Now, I want to talk about a calling because a calling is very important. You've all heard the adage, some are called, some are sent, some just picked up their Bibles and went. Well, you know, the challenge of establishing a church and planting a true church uh, is very exacting on a minister and his family. So one must be very sure that they are called. If you're not called to be a home missionary, then you need to just stay there underneath your pastor in your home church where your family can be cared for and blessed and you can fellowship with a large group of believers. Because once you step out to plant a church, many times you might find yourself the only one at church. And uh, maybe you and your companion and ever how many children you've got are the only ones that you have to preach to. Uh, those times can get very lonely. Trust me. And most home missionaries... Uh, have to uh, work a secular job as well as their uh, pastoral job, and that can get very exacting and taxing on, uh, on a home missionary's family. A home missionary's companion is very important because that companion should feel the call and the burden as well as the minister himself. So the calling is very important, and the calling needs to not only touch the man, but it also needs to touch the man's wife. The man needs to be a strong man. He needs to be a man that is strong enough to uh, put in a 40 or even a 60 hour work week and also teach and preach on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. He needs to be a man that can take care of both his family and his church. Because financially, because in the beginning you probably will be required to do both. So
So I want to talk to you about a calling. You must have a calling. If you don't have a calling, you'll go out and find yourself disillusioned and then come back. Only the calling keeps you when the hours are dark and when the money is little and when the fellowship is almost non-existent. So what constitutes a calling? Well, number one, uh, an individual must see that there is a need. So do you see the need of a home missionary? Do you see the need of a church being planted in town X or county X or state X? Do you see the need? Secondly, the second thing that is required for a calling is do you have a desire to fulfill that need? A lot of people see the need of various things in the kingdom of God, but they really don't have any desire to put skin in the game. Do you see the desire to fulfill the need that you see? Do you have the desire, I should say, to fulfill the need that you see? And well, if you have the desire now, it doesn't stop there, the calling. And many people make the mistake of thinking, if I see the need and if I have a desire to fulfill that need, that means I'm called. No, there's one other thing that is uh, very much necessary, and that is the ability to fulfill your desire. So there are three things. Do you see the need? Do you have the desire to fulfill that need? And then do you have the ability to fulfill your desire? You see, a lot of people see the need and see and have the des desire, but really they don't possess the gifting. They don't possess the tools that it takes to fulfill that, uh, that need and to fulfill the desire that they have. So what is the ability to, uh, for a home missionary? You must be well educated in the Word of God. You must love people, and you must have a sacrificing spirit and a sacrificing attitude. Other men will pastor churches that have been well established and they will have large salaries and their wives will wear the best of clothes at conferences and their children will uh, maybe even be able to attend private schools and things of that nature. But the home missionary family, not only does the home missionary sacrifice, but the entire family has to have a sacrificial spirit as well. Now, if I am painting a picture that is discouraging, I mean to, because if I can discourage you from being a home missionary, I want to, because I know I have been there, and I, I, don't, I, I don't cherish the idea of sending men and women and children into that fray that are only going to go half-hearted and not with a true calling and a true mission in their life. The, the second thing that I want to talk to you about is justification. Now, what do I mean by justification? Well, if um, you want to start a church and you feel called to start a new church on the other side of town of the church that you are now worshiping in or fellowshipping in, or in another town, or in another county, or even in another state. Uh, is it justified? Wow. What kind of question is that? Is it justified? The, I believe, as a home missionary myself, that there needs to be a justification for the starting of any new church. Well, there are some things that will determine whether or not it's justified to start a church. Now, if there is not a true church teaching the true plan of salvation and embracing the sacraments the way that Christ instituted them and the apostles, 
if there's not a church doing that in that town, then there is a justification for you going. But if the town that you have a desire to plant a church in has a good, strong, apostolic church in that town, then you need to pray and ask the Lord if it would be justified to start another church there. Now, sometimes there is. I, I myself started a church in uh, Kingsport, Tennessee, and uh, there were uh, 36 oneness Pentecostal churches in and around Kingsport. Uh, Kingsport's a town of, I don't know, I'm going to guess here, maybe 60, uh, 70,000, maybe even a little less. And uh, I was uh, very much resisted by the apostolic churches that were in the area, saying, we've got enough. We've got enough. I knew God had laid a strong burden on my heart to start a church there. So I began to look for the justification. Now, for me, the justification was that uh, we are sacramental. The Apostolic Orthodox Church International is sacramental. And although at that time the Apostolic Orthodox Church did not exist, yet it did exist in its germ state in my ministry because I taught that the Lord's Supper needed to be observed every Lord's Day. No other apostolic church, although there were 36 of them there, none of them offered the Lord's Supper very regularly at all, maybe once a year, uh, some maybe five or ten years apart from, from offering their people communion uh, to the next time they offered the people communion. Well, listen, a, 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 an off a, a orchestra, a choir, an orator in the form of a preacher, an offertory, and a nice building does not make a church in the New Testament sense. If the Lord's body and blood is not being made available to God's people for whom Christ has died, the pastor is not then feeding the people the body and blood of Christ. So that was my justification. So you need to ask yourself the question, is there a justification for your church? If uh, the gospel is well represented, then there might not be a justification. It might be better that you go to another town and or another place that does not have a clear witness of the faith. All right. The third thing I want to talk about is prayer and fasting. Now, um, Jesus said concerning one that was demon-possessed, he said, this kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting. Now, friend, when you go into an area that uh, does not have a true church, where uh, a true apostolic anointed ministry has not cleared the ground of demonic power and strongholds, then you're going into the enemy's territory where he has had free sway for many generations. And believe me, he's going to muster his forces to combat you. So you don't want to go alone. You want to go in the power and the might of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can't go in the flesh. I don't care how good of a musician you are, how good of a singer you are, how good of an orator you are, how much money you got bankrolling you. You've got to go in the power and the strength of the Spirit. So if Jesus said, this kind goes not out but, but prayer and fasting concerning the, the demonic possessed, so much so the more of a city that has been possessed by demonic spirits from its conception. When you go in to challenge that, you need to have enlisted the help of the holy angels. And they need to go before you to clear the way. They need to stand guard over your home at night. They need, and that's another thing, if you're going to be a home missionary to a town, move to that town. Live in that town. Uh, let your house be 
uh, ground zero of the activity of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God in that town or in that region. Amen. But you must enlist the help of the angels, the help of uh, the spirits of God that are ministering spirits that are sent forth to minister for God on your behalf and to God on your behalf. Or I should say, to you on God's behalf and to God on your behalf. And also those strong angels that combat the lieutenants of the dark one. Amen. I know what I speak of. In starting a home mission work in one place, I was uh, tormented uh, for about uh, a month of time, about four weeks, almost a complete four weeks, of uh, a spirit outside my home calling my name during the night, waking me up. I'd go and look. There would be nobody there. Go back and lay back down, and the spirit would call my name again until I go and look. And I, I was tormented by that. And, and what it, the spirit was doing was just trying to to unravel my nerves and, and, and destroy my health where that that work could not go forth. So I'm telling you, prayer and fasting is should be a regiment with your life before you go and also once you get in that circumstance in that campaign. Uh, I want to talk to you now about the uh, types of pastors uh, that we have in the New Testament, or what the New Testament gives us as as uh, uh, a uh, uh, a similarity of the soul winner, as far as a home mission is concerned, the Bible talks about the soul winner as being a farmer, talks about the the soul winner as being a shepherd, and talks about the soul winner as being a fisherman. Jesus told his disciples he was going to make them fishers of men. Amen. But also, a home missionary is a farmer. Let me talk to you about that first. Now, a farmer, when he, before he plants his crops, he's going to test his soil. He's going to look at his soil. He's going to consider his soil. And he's going to consider his growing season, his climate. And then he's going to plant seed that is appropriate to the soil and uh, that is appropriate to his growing season. A farmer in uh, the uh, Midwest and further north is not going to plant cotton. A uh, farmer in the south who plants cotton is looking for sandy and clay kind of soil. The farmer in the Midwest that plants soybeans and and corn and things of that nature is looking for the kind of earth and the growing season for that. So you as a home missionary are a farmer. In other words, you're going to plant seed and you're going to expect a crop. Well, you've got to plant the right seed. Or I should say you have to plant it in the right way. And you have to be adapted for your growing season. Uh, the seed is the gospel, and the gospel is good no matter where in the world that we're going to, to sow it. But still and yet, there are things that we need to consider. Now, uh, if you, you need to consider the kind of people you're going to be working with. <clears throat> you need to consider how that they're going to respond to the ministry that you have. And you know who you are. Or if you don't know yourself, then get with your pastor who knows you and ask him who you are. Because he can probably tell you maybe even better than you know who you are. Uh, but you need to know yourself. You need to know your limitations. You need to know your, your abilities. What is your education? Uh, because your education is going to determine the kind of people that you can reach. Uh, what is your... Uh, uh, financial prowess, your financial ability, because that's going to determine what kind of area that you can go in and hold out long enough for that 
congregation to get up around 50 or 70 people so it can take care of itself. Because trust me, unless you have a, 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 a church group backing you and sending you money, you're going to have to support that church yourself until it gets up to where it can support itself. So you need to look at the area that you're going to be working in. And you need, to cons you need to choose an area that is conducive to you, is conducive to your education, conducive to your lifestyle, conducive to your tradition, conducive to your family, uh, in as many ways as is possible. Also, uh, the, uh, the minister is likened to a shepherd. So shepherd needs to be matched to sheep. And this is pretty much the, the same uh, likeness as I was talking about the farmer choosing his soil. But, you know, if, if you, you need to look at the education of the people that you want to pull your church from, and you need to match that. If, if you are lacking, then you need to go back to school and you need to get an education that you can talk the language of the people to whom you are wanting to pastor and to whom you're wanting to make up your church. Next thing, it says he'll make you fishers of men. Well, in being a fisher, fisherman, you know, you need to decide what fish you want to catch and use the bait that is conducive to that fish. And, you know, you, you, you don't catch everything on a worm, do you? Or you don't uh, mix up little uh, balls of meal and catch everything with that. So different fish is caught by different bait. You need to take all this in consideration. And you need to be wise in your reaching for the loss. The Lord uh, called me to go to Baltimore, Maryland when I was yet in my 20s. And uh, I went out to Baltimore for about uh, a week and looked the city over and got with the ministers that was in Washington, D.C., and they took me up there. And uh, we looked the city over, and there was not an apostolic church functioning in the city. There had been churches in the suburbs. You see, that's the thing. Uh <laughs> Uh, and, and I don't mean to cross swords with anybody on this, but preachers, a lot of times, they won't preach to people that can't pay them. So getting a preacher to go into the inner city, in our inner cities, is a little bit difficult. They want to pastor in the suburbs where the money is. Now, I understand that you've got to have money to run your church, and you've got to have money to finance evang evangelism. I understand all of that, but... We, we need churches in the inner city, and that's where I wanted to go. So I ended up putting a church on South Broadway in the inner city of, of Baltimore. And to begin with, it, it, was just, it was just my family and I. I had one child at the time. And we arrived in the city with just a very few dollars. I uh, didn't have a church backing me to go uh, at that time, I was uh, an independent minister. So all I had was a burden. And uh, I got into the city with just a very few dollars left. I think I left Illinois with $300. And I got into the city with uh, the, the, the biggest part of that. It was over $100, maybe closer to, to 200 but we were able, I spent the first night in a motel, and then I went out the next day and talked a, uh, the proprietor of a, of a uh, rental uh, complex to rent us a, a small apartment just on, uh, with a very few dollars. And then I filled the car up with gas. I went to the furniture rental company, and I rented a table and chairs and a bed. And uh, the apartment came furnished with a stove and a refrigerator. And then I took the few dollars that I had left, which was just a very few, and I went out and bought a grocery bill that consisted of two items, beans and potatoes. That's all. 
beans and potatoes. And uh, then the next day, uh, that was like on a Tuesday, the next day was Wednesday, I found a job. I was a welder, so I found a job welding and uh, talked the, uh, talk the proprietor into paying me uh, at the end of that week for those three or four days that I worked, that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and maybe I even worked Saturday. And then we were off and running. It took me about a month to uh, get together a little bit of money to rent a uh, storefront. And then once that was done, then I chose an area of the city that was uh, conducive to who I was. I didn't go to the, to the mansions of the town, nor did I go to the very uh, squalor of the town either. I went to the blue-collar areas that salt-of-the-earth kind of people. And uh, I began to mind that community, to look for people who were unchurched, people who were hungry for God, people that I could help. So I was a fisherman, so I chose people that were in my category and people that uh, I could uh, reach and uh, people that I could shepherd, I could speak their language, they spoke mine, I knew their life challenges because I had the same kind of life challenges. And you see, once you get a people into the church and they uh, begin to change their lifestyle, they stop smoking cigarettes, they stop uh, drinking alcohol, they don't do drugs anymore, they're faithful to their wives and their husbands, then they, after a while, begin to have more money than they ever had before. And then before too long, that church that you started in the blue-collar area, well, now you've moved out to the suburbs and you are in a uh, more affluent area because your people have become more affluent because God is bringing them up and is saving them in a complete sense. Now, as you go into the suburbs from the inner city, don't forget the pit from which you were dug. And take someone from your church that you have trained, some good deacon and his wife, some good young minister and his wife, and put them back in that inner city as a missions outreach for Bible study or our Saturday night service or something like that. And then they can bring those people back to your church on Sunday morning. So then what I did, and I want to share with you what I did, because what I did worked. And I did it not only there, but nine different times. I started nine home missions works in nine different cities or in nine different locations. Some of them were in the Appalachia, in the rural coal mining country. Some of it was uh, in metropolitan areas. So the things I'm telling you here work no matter where you are. So what I did, because it was just myself in the beginning, I didn't have a large church backing me or an organization backing me. So what I did is I took, I, I, I'm not a musician, so I don't have that drawing card for people. And too much of Pentecost uses that anyway as a drawing card uh, to get people. I can name ministries now that you were very familiar with that were it not for their music ability they wouldn't have a church at all or they wouldn't have a ministry at all well i'm not a musician uh, i didn't have music to draw people uh i wasn't famous so i didn't have any popularity to draw people all i had was truth <clears throat> So people that I reached, I must reach with the Bible. I must reach with the gospel. I must reach with the truth. So I chose 12 doctrinal tracks that started out very lightly and, and grew in intensity in doctrine up to the 12th one. Each track was a Bible lesson. And then I went into this area of the city that was the working class blue collar because that's what I was. And by this time, I, was, I had changed jobs. I, was work, I went to work at first in a little welding shop, and then for, in about a month, I, I went to work for Bethlehem Steel Shipyards building ships. <laughs> so uh, I, I, by this time, I was a shipbuilder. 
So now I choose that part of the city that my people are, are living in. And then I choose 12 or 20 homes. And then I go to those 20 homes on Saturday morning, not too early, give people time to get up, about uh, 10.30 to about 12. That hour and a half their window is a good time. And I went there and I would knock on the door and the people would come to the door and I would give them the brochure and invite them to church. The brochure had our church address and our service schedule on it. You never want to go block walking or knocking on doors unless you have something to leave the people, a brochure to leave in their hand, to leave with them so they remember your visit. And uh, then I went to those 20 homes and delivered that first track. Everybody got the same track. Then the next week, I went back to the same 20 homes. Now, you don't want to just go to a home and then you don't go back to that home for 10 years or another year. Now, that's not being a good farmer. That's not being a good fisherman. You know, first, as a fisherman, you want to chum the water. You want to put something in the water that's going to get the fish excited and get the fish biting. You want to turn that, as a farmer, you want to turn that soil over and get it loose and get it where it will receive your seed. Now, there is a law of the harvest that states you can't reap a harvest where you have not sown seed. You can't just go and get a building, I don't care how nice it is, and, and start having services and expect to have revival. If you're going to reap the harvest, you've got to plant the seed. You must saturate your community with the seed of the Word of God. So I chose 20 homes, and I went to those same 20 homes. Yes, the same 20 homes for 12 consecutive weeks and delivered to them a new Bible lesson in written form each week. Now, I did not get into any Bible discussion with any of them during those 12 weeks. Some of them dropped out during that 12-week period, said, I don't want to receive your literature anymore. I said, okay. So then that day, I just picked up another home, and uh, but I kept the number at 20. And then finally, when I delivered that 20th brochure, then I made a request. By this time, I had become on first name basis with them. I knew their children's name. I knew where they worked. I knew uh, a lot of things about the family. And uh, they had become friends. So then I said, would you please permit me to come and teach a Bible lesson in your home once a week for one hour. I promise it won't be longer than one hour. And out of those 20 homes, I got five or six people that said, yes, we would love to have a Bible study. And then out of that five or six, two or three of them, I would end up baptizing. Then after that was done, after that 20 homes was done, while I was teaching those Bible studies, then I would have already staked out 20 more homes and was doing the same thing then. The only difference is now that after I have baptized two or three families, now my church is growing and now I have help because those who have been won by this method see the benefit of the method so they are faithful supporters and participants in this kind of fishing or in this time of kind of farming. And uh, so then the church is up and going. And it works, friend. But it takes a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But it works. Get ready to do a lot of block walking. Now, I want to talk to you about cell duplication. And I'm going to try to bring this to a close here pretty quick. Cell duplication is that the church is the body of Christ. And the way that our bodies grow and mature is through cell duplication. One cell at conception, that 23 chromosomes from the woman and 23 chromosomes from the man, 
blend and become that 46 chromosomes of one cell. Then that one cell matures, and when it matures, it divides and becomes two. When those two mature, they divide and become four. And then just, all oh, the, the, then it just goes wild. The cells just begin to duplicate and, 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 and multiply, and some cells pair off and become flesh, some become bones, some become organs, some become hair follicles, and so forth and so on. Now, that's the way the body of Christ is supposed to grow and to fill the earth. Amen. And it doesn't do it so much sometimes because human flesh gets involved and pastors get wanting to build their own kingdom instead of building the kingdom of God. So they don't want anybody leaving them and going off. But here's the thing. Once a cell matures, it's going to divide. It's going to divide peaceably or it's going to divide not peaceably. What am I talking about? I'm talking about when a pastor reproduces himself in the church. In other words, he's reproduced another pastor in the pews. Uh, the, the music team has reproduced other musicians. The choir has reproduced other people that can. You got enough people in your church for two choirs. Uh, you musicians, you got enough musicians, you can't use them all. Now, a wise pastor will see that that sale has matured. And if he's wise, he will divide it and become two. Now, that's the way that new churches should be started in the kingdom of God. Most of the time, they're not. It's usually just a lone home missionary has to go out and brave it by himself. But it should not be that way. A church who has matured should send a pastor who is ordained already and who is trained with a ministry team, with musicians, and into an area, and maybe fund or pay the first year rent on a building, or maybe and also maybe even pay the first year uh, rent on the on the missionary's residence, so that full energy can be given into building that congregation. Now, when I was in my prime of starting home missions churches, I could establish a congregation in just about any city, at least in the United States. Any city in the United States within a year, I could have anywhere between 30 and 50 people. Using the method that I have just described. A lot of home Bible studies. A lot of burning the midnight oil. But if you work it, it will work. Now, if you have a church behind you that is investing in you, then all the better. And you can grow that much more. And that's the way that it should be. But then you need to remember, home missionary, that when you reproduce yourself in your church 10, 15 years down the road, when you produce uh, another church secretary or our treasurer, when you reproduce uh, another, other musicians, when you, when you have enough people in your church to have two, have a mirror of uh, your ministry team, then that cell needs to divide. You need to bring it apart peaceably, and you need to send them out. Now, that pastor who sends out the other pastor becomes the uh, bishop in all practicality of the thing and he becomes the overseer the pastor overseer and that pastor that goes and starts a home missions church that's supported by the mother church ties back to the mother church the pastor ties his income back to the mother church and the church will tie their church offerings back to the mother church so then that there is a uh, giving in both respects there is a incentive on, in, on starting satellite works. And the mother church does not uh, just become uh, the loser, but continues to grow herself 
and continues to benefit herself in the work of the Lord. My, my time has gotten away from me. I apologize. Let, let, just a couple of more things. Usually, when you're starting a work, or even if you're pastoring an established work, doctrine is not the most important thing to the congregation. It should be, but it's not. The most important thing to the congregation is community. That they feel that they are a part of a loving, caring community. You can have all the right doctrine, but just turn people off entirely because they know you don't have a heart that cares for them. They can tell that you don't have a father's heart. You don't have a shepherd's heart. You don't really care for the soil. You don't really care for the fish. <laughs> so community is the most important thing. And you need to work, pastors, to create a loving, caring community that cares for its own first and then reaches out to those others that are not part of your community. The thing that made that first century church so successful was that they remembered the poor. And they remembered the poor of their own household of faith first, and then the poor of the others. They had all things common. They, they, they shared what they had. And when the world saw this, the world said, hey, look at the Christians. <laughs> There's not a one of them in lack, not a one of them in want, because they take care of one another. Their poor are taken care of. Community is the most important thing to your congregation. Now, uh, in your congregation, there are those to whom doctrine is very important. Now, you know that doctrine is important to everybody, even those who don't think that it is. So you know you're going to preach the truth. You're going to baptize them correctly. You're going to bring them regularly to the Lord's table. You're going to pray for them to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You're going to teach holiness. You're going to do all of this. You, you, you're going to teach proper eschatology. You're going to do all of this. But you know that that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is community. But now there are those that no matter how good you are at community, if, if you're not really shelling the corn in doctrine and bringing revelation knowledge to them, they're not going to stay with you. You have to constantly be deep and deeper and yet deeper yet in the word of God for a certain kind of person. Now, for that, now you, those people to whom community is important, you can absolutely strangle them by teaching doctrine. You can absolutely strangle them by teaching truth. So you got to be wise. And in your wisdom, you will keep your Sunday morning service very generic and very, I'm going to use the word for lack of a better word, shallow very surface. You're going to teach faith. You're going to teach love your neighbor. You're going to teach forgiveness. You're going to teach be a good husband, be a good wife. Children, honor your parents. And you're going to give an altar call and you're going to pray for sinners. And your Sunday night service will be evangelistic, but you can be a little bit more meaty on your Sunday night. But your Wednesday night you can have as your uh, new converts class night, as your discipling night. And then you can have a pastor's Bible study for the deep things, for those things that you're not going to teach everybody, for those things that you're going to teach that inner circle. Learn from Jesus and Paul and the apostles. <clears throat> Jesus had a message that he preached to the multitudes and they loved him for it. They followed him for the loaves and the fishes. Then from the multitudes, Jesus chose 70. 
And that 70 became his vanguard, his evangelist, that he sent out to Batu in front of him uh, before he came into a town or an area. To them, he gave authority he did not give the multitudes, and he taught them things he did not teach the multitudes. Then, from that 70, he chose an inner circle of 12. Now, those inner circle, that inner circle of 12, he required more of, he taught more to, and he gave more authority. But he didn't stop there. From that inner circle of 12, he chose an inner circle of three. And those three accompanied him deeper into his agony and deeper into his ecstasy than any others. But he didn't stop there. From the three, he chose one. And to Peter, he gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven. To Peter, he gave authority. He gave no one else. Jesus was the king, but Peter was the prime minister of the kingdom. Peter was carried into a crucible. He was carried into a place of crucifixion that no one else went into. Peter came to Jesus when Jesus was talking about how he was going to die. And Peter said, not so. We will not let that happen to you. Jesus looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Then Jesus says to Peter, Peter, Satan has desired you to sift you as wheat. Satan didn't desire James and John. He didn't desire the other apostles. He didn't desire the 70. He didn't desire the multitude. But he desired Peter. Now listen to Jesus. Jesus says, Peter, Satan has desired you to sift you as wheat. But, uh, oh Jesus, did you have to use the word but there? I've prayed for you. And when you return, strengthen the brethren. Jesus said, I've prayed for you that you will not lose your faith. Now what was Jesus saying? You've probably never thought of this. Jesus was saying to Peter, Satan, uh, Peter, Satan has desired you to sift you as wheat, and I've given you up. Wow. God wouldn't do that. Well, he did it to Job in the Old Testament, and he does it to Peter right here. I've given you up, and you're going to go through something. But when you return, I've prayed for you that you won't lose your faith. And when you return, strengthen the brethren. Jesus is saying, I've given you up, Peter, but I know your faith won't be destroyed and you will return. You see, when Peter denied knowing the Lord, God had lifted his protection off of Peter. Peter had already been baptized. Peter was in the church of Jesus Christ. And Peter denied knowing the Lord, not once, not twice, but three times. And then the cock crew. Peter was stripped down to his bare soul. No more pride. There's no more room for Peter to have pride. He'll forever now be known as the apostle that denied the Lord. But in that brokenness and in that, in the exacting of that, of that total payment from Peter, God could use him like he used none of the other apostles. So my friend, be wise Learn discipleship from the Lord. You don't teach everything to everybody. You have the multitudes, the Sunday morning crowd. You have the Sunday night. You have the Wednesday night. You have that inner circle of pastoral disciples that you teach things to that would choke others. This is what... 
I have to say concerning church planting. I trust that you will have a great experience and a great reward. Go forth in the power of the Lord and the strength of his might. Slay the dragons. Build the monuments and the memorials for the kingdom of God. Don't be concerned that people ever know your name, but live your life, pastor your church, conduct your ministry so that after the Lord has called you home and somebody else comes down this road that you are cutting in the wilderness, they will have to admit a man of God has passed this way before me. Amen. God bless you, friends. And we ask that the Lord would bless you in spirit, soul, and body. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen and amen.